Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this competitive advantage talk presented by Kraft Analytics Group. My name is Max Williams. I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce this presentation, how Bob Slang, the Roman army in throw and coaching evolved the world of soccer. Please join me in welcoming speaker Thomas Gronemark, founder of Throw-In, to the stage. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Gronemark. I'm from Denmark, and I'm a professional soccer throwing coach. Um, I have like two jobs. One thing is, is coaching, analyzing, and in soccer. The other job is doing talks around innovation, and I had the pleasure to do a talk um, yesterday at uh, Howard Medical School for doctors who are doing disaster medics. And, and even though sports, even though soccer is really important, if you can help people save other people's lives, I think, yeah, that, that yeah, <laughs> makes, gives even more meaning, yeah. So, but again, I'm a, I'm a soccer throwing coach, and, and to be honest, it, it hasn't been an easy path. Um, but I've all, always been really passionate about soccer throw-ins. And, and yeah, that may sound weird, but, but already as a small kid, I was really crazy about throw-ins. You can, um, and, and first let me say, I'm going through uh, discover innovative knowledge, combine forgotten elements, find crazy inspiration, be the kindness when you want to integrate innovative knowledge and see the analysis from thousand eyes. But back again to me, myself and I, um, this is from the early 80s. It's me on the left, and some people say I look like a, a young Boris Becker from tennis. I don't know if any one of you know him. But um, I was crazy about soccer throw-ins because my big cousins, Ben and Johnny, they were really good at throw-ins. And I really looked up to them, and perhaps some of you have older brothers, sisters, cousins, or, yeah. And, and I thought they were super cool because they could do long throw-ins. But I played soccer for up to, I was like around 20 years old. I played in the highest Danish U19 league, so I was quite good. But I wasn't talented enough to be a professional soccer player. So in the mid-90s, I changed sports to athletics. And uh, I came on the Danish national team the first year I was training. I had six years in athletics where I won uh, several championships in 200, 400 meters. And this is from Paris in year 2000 where we won the European championship in the 4 by 400 meter relay for club teams. It's me second from the left. Um, so, but in 2002, um, I changed sport again because, uh, not because I was unsuccessful in athletics, but because I moved to a small town in, in the western part of Denmark. I did it because I met my wife, and I don't know if some one of you have done something stupid because of love, but suddenly I was training alone, and yeah, so I knew I had to change sport. I knew I had to find a team sport, but also knew it shouldn't be a sport that was too dangerous because as a child, I was really afraid of driving in, in roller coasters, and I was always puking, and, and my mom, she said, oh, it's good for kids to go in roller coasters, but it was really bad for me. But in 2002, I changed sport again, and I changed to the Danish national bobsleigh team. And <laughs> that may sound crazy when, when you're afraid of roller coasters, but, but bobsleigh, is, that's, that's not like a roller coaster. It's, it's 100 times wilder than a roller coaster, but you don't get sick of it. But of course, you have to be mentally strong to, to sit in a sled like that. But uh, we were really innovative on the Danish bobsleigh team because we, had, we, we didn't have many money compared to the other teams. So, um, yeah, we, we, we tried to, to, to find new solutions in bobsleigh, and one of the things we did was that we had a, um, a feedback tool who was named after MacGyver. Do some of you know MacGyver, the, the TV star? He, could, he was really innovative too. So we had a thing called MacGyver Entwicklungsstufe 10. That's on German, and it means MacGyver Development Step 10. And that was just like notes. So if you had an idea who was bad, you got a MacGyver uh, Development Step 2. Middle idea, that was uh, perhaps MacGyver development step five. And then a good idea, you can take directly into the bobsleigh sport, that was perhaps a MacGyver development step nine. But no matter what, if you got a bad, a middle, or a good note, we thought about, hey, what would MacGyver do to develop this? 
So um, we were really innovative, and this talk is not long enough to tell about what we did in the bobsleigh sport, but one thing that was really important, and that's leading up to here, combine forgotten ele uh, elements and find uh, new areas to analyze. Uh, in 2004, in the middle of the bobsleigh period, we were playing an indoor soccer match against the German national bobsleigh team. It was because we had a cooperation with them. It was just a warm-up for the physical training. Then suddenly, I did a long throw-in, in, in the small football pitch, all the way up to the other end. And all the other ones said, wow, how could you do that? And, and I said, hey, I was, I was good at throw-ins when I played soccer myself. And then suddenly I got an idea. Hey, if I can make a good throw-in, can't I teach other players to do it? So I said it to my teammates, I want to be a throwing coach. And normally people would have laughed at me, but, but I got a MacGyver development step seven. So that was a pretty good note. Um, but but again, on one hand, yeah, throw-ins. There were throw-ins in football, but, but what could you do? So uh, after that bobsleigh period uh, uh, in 2004, January 2004, I got home to my local library in Denmark and tried to find a book about throw-ins. But there were no books at all, and I searched the internet. Nothing about throw-ins, at least not serious. So I had to do a, a throwing course myself. We were not only uh, innovative in the bobsleigh team, we were also doing a lot of video analysis. We did like two, 3,000 video analysis of our start every year. Where is the foot place, the hip, the hands, how to jump into the sled? So I was trained in video analysis already there. So I analyzed myself, and after approximately six months, I had a throwing course. And I could have been starting with a youth or amateur team, because to be honest, I didn't know if it would work out, because I've only tested myself. But then I had the courage in October 2004 to call a local Danish Super League team called Vibor. They said yes, and I started as a long throw-in uh, coach. And it went really well. The players improved a lot. Uh, they scored a lot of goals after long throw-ins, and they had the best placements in, in the history ever. So um, the f I was a professional throwing coach in October 2004, and just again, we have limited time here, but just want to show some of the results here. I'm working with throwing technique. I'm having 30 different technical parameters. I use video analysis. It's individual made. Most of my players, if I coach them through a period, they are improving between 5 and 15 meters only with technical training, no weight training or no. So we had Kian Hansen from FC Midtjylland, started with a 30-70, who was really high, and then he improved to almost 37, where the ball came like a rocket. We had a couple of guys, they're all from FC Midtjylland. The best one, Andreas Paulsen, he improved almost 14 meters. The little number here with bold 923, that's the throw-in area. So if you're standing in the middle of the pitch, you can throw in 180 degrees. So you're just cal calculating the throw-in area after the throwing length. FC Midtjylland scored 35 goals in the last four seasons. It was there from long throw-in, so almost nine per, per season. Uh, had two Danish championships. I had a year. AC Horsens in the 16-17 season, 10 goals in one season directly from long throw-ins. And then another important one, Andy Robinson from Liverpool FC. He started with 19 meters. A lot of you in here, you can throw further than 19 meters. And even though he'll never be one of the best in the world at long throw-ins, he improved to 27 meters and gained more than 530 square meters on his throw-in area. And because when he threw that short 19 meters, it was way too easy for the opponents to put pressure. So again, gaining throwing length can both be a weapon, but also an extra uh, opportunity to throw to your teammates. But on to the next one, find crazy inspiration and expand your approach to your challenge. And in 2007, I had just got my third uh, team to coach in the throw-ins. But then suddenly the team sacked uh, the manager. They had a new manager who didn't want to use long throw-ins. So I was still hired, I was still paid a lot, but I didn't really train there, so that was really frustrating. Suddenly I saw a game from Silkeborg, as the team was called. They lost a throw-in in the middle of the pitch, then they lost the next one and the next one. And I thought, hey, is it only Silkeborg who is so bad at throw-ins? So I looked at all the, at all the, the Soccer matches are good from the Bundesliga, from the Premier League, from the Champions League. 
And I was totally in shock because I realized that most of the team lost the ball in more than 50% of the occasions where they had a throw in under pressure where the players are marked. And if you do the same with your feet in the middle of the pitch, you're only playing Sunday League football. And the most scary thing was that the commentators didn't say anything at all. So I knew here, now it's not only the long throw-ins, because that was mostly for the tall and strong teams. No, all teams in the world can use what I call the fast and clever throw-ins. So I started working on the, my fast, long, fast and clever throw-in philosophy. All in all, it's all the throw-ins all around the pitch. And I was not only taking things from sports to develop it. Yes, I took things from basketball, my own experience in, in, in soccer too. But I also found a lot of alternative knowledge. One of the things I looked at was painting in museums. Here's a, here's a painting from Friedrich Hundert, who was a, a, an Austrian artist. So I saw that and saw some running patterns and so, so found a lot of inspiration there. I look at, I saw some research and histories of the Roman army, how they structured you know, their warfare, how they, they led their bowers from shooting the arrows in behind in the ranks so they wouldn't step over each other, fall over each other. So things like that for the defensive organization in the throwing coaching. And then I also took inspiration from a thing called Black Sun. We have it in Denmark. Every two times a year, in the spring and the fall, there are uh, millions of starlings coming there. They're flying in these formations because they want to avoid being eaten by predator birds. And, uh, and scientists found out that they are navigating around the nearest seven birds around them. So, so that's the reason why they, 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 they fly in these formations. So I use a lot of this knowledge also to see how can we make drills around scanning so you're aware of what's happening all around you, both attacking-wise, defending-wise. I also found out that these starlings also, as a defensive mechanism, they shit on the predator bird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, say, I'll say I didn't choose to use that in my throwing coaching. So, um, but, but again, I worked on with my long, fast, and clever throwing philosophy. And to be honest, I, again, in 2007, 8 I thought, hey, I'll get my international breakthrough in, in a year or so because I knew every soccer team in the world could use this. But no one wanted my knowledge around the fast and clever throw-ins. Only the long throw-ins. I still had success there. A lot of teams, in, in, especially in the Danish Super League, but I had to wait until uh, July 2018, because suddenly there, uh, I was visiting a chocolate shop with my family in Denmark, and suddenly the phone rang, and it was Jurgen Klopp from Liverpool FC. Um, and yeah, if, if all of you don't know him, it's, it's one of the most famous managers for one of the biggest clubs in the world. So uh, since July 2018, I've been coaching Liverpool FC. Uh, this international breakthrough has been meaning that I'm not only coaching Liverpool, I'm coaching clubs all around the world. I think the last five seasons, it's been 30 different professional clubs, the whole Europe, Mexico, the States, yeah. And uh, the way I do it is, is I, of course, I do analysis. This here is all is about analysis, but I'm also coaching uh, the players. For example, I've just been sitting here before. I got the, the throw-ins from the Wolves game here earlier this week. And the way I do it, I can't show everything, but the way I do it is that I'm measuring throw-ins under pressure. Uh, how much possession do you have? This is the Manchester City game from December. Uh, then I have a resume about how did we do a short resume. And then I have highlights. I've chosen not to show the highlights here. Attacking, defending highlights, typically three, four, five, six, all in all. And then I have the full report underneath. Um, so, so, so that's the way my throw-in analysis work. But if I should look at how do I work all in all? Because I'm both working in front of the screen, I'm working on the pitch myself. So first I do uh, analysis and looking at, at possession. Uh, again, like, like I mentioned before, uh, throw-ins under pressure where the players are marked. Uh, and it's really important for me to say that yes, the possession can show something, but sometimes it's also okay not to have possession because if we have a, what I call, call a low risk, high reward situation, uh, for example, near the opponent's penalty area, it's okay to lose the possession, lose the duel, or give them a goal kick if we had good space and we had a good chance to, to create something great. So, so yes, possession is good, but it's not the whole truth, like many of you know. Um, then for me, the most important thing is also looking between the lines, because if you're just giving the coaches a number, 
you know, what can you use that for? Yes, you are good, but, but we want to make changes also so we can be even better or, or have the same good level. So, so all this analysis there, we use that in training. And I'm not, I'm a freelancer, so I'm, for example, in Liverpool, I'm not there all the time. But uh, when I'm there, I'm training the players myself. Um, and different exercises, I have like three parts. The first, it's the basic part. It's all about, of course, throwing longer, throwing more precise, but also team space creation. And because a lot of soccer players, they are only moving for themselves and not moving at all. But we want all players uh, to help each other create space because then we ha have a higher quality of space. Um, so that's all the basic things. Then the, the second part is small-sided games where I use different tools, also the basic knowledge, so they learn to have the relations in a two versus two, three versus three, three versus three with a neutral, with fast throw-ins and things like that. And then the third level is what I'm working with the zones there, three different zones, yeah. And, and then I have ITS, uh, individual throw-in superpowers, because it means that some players are fast, they can like really run into the back room, down behind the defense. Some players are good with the first touch. They're really good at, for example, return passes or receiving in the middle. Some p uh, players are good at, at protecting um, a big box or so, so they can keep possession, play side passes. Some players are good at creating space. They are space creators, not for themselves, but for other teammates. So all these things I try to incorporate in the training with tailor-made training. So I do it. Um, tailor-made, so it's, yeah, I look at the, the, the team's playing style, the, uh, the team's formation, of course I communicate a lot with the coaches, and what I said before is that I think to, to make analysis worthful, I think we have to have a lot of communication, build the bridges between people so we understand, so if it's only made through a mail or something like that, so, so I think building bridges is perhaps one of the most important things when you have knowledge. So again, I also wrote be kind, and that, that's maybe a <laughs> be kind, does that mean anything? Yeah, it's, it's really important to be very kind to, to have success with your analysis too. Um, and we know from research also that the best teams, the performing the best way, that, that's, that's where you have the closest work relations. So even though we are all skillful at what we do, it's, it's uh, that we can connect with, with, with other people that's, for me, perhaps the most important. And then we have the match. When the players are playing then, they've heard the analysis, they've trained, and when we have a throw in, we want to get the ball fast, we want to scan, can it throw fast? Is it a good option? If there's not a good option, we don't throw. If there's a good option, we throw. But if there's not a good option, we take a decision. Yeah, we don't throw. Then we have patience. And in soccer, you can easily wait 10, 15 seconds, space creation. And then we have to make a decision. So uh, you can't really compare throw-ins to normal other set pieces like corners and free kicks. Um, yes, and then we have... Um, what has my work done in Liverpool FC? The first season, like the season before I came to Liverpool FC in the 17-18 season, Liverpool were only number, number 18 out of 20 in the Premier League with a possession of 45.4% at throw-ins under pressure. But in my first season, we improved with 23% to 68.4% and went from number 18 in the Premier League to number one in the Premier League. Also number two in the whole Europe, just after one of my other teams, FC Midtjylland. And as you can imagine, I have shared that like a million times because this is not my data. It's other people's data then. Yes. So, <laughs> so um, but again, I think the questions are coming just in a few seconds here, but the, la the last thing I want to say that sometimes it's small, small, small things that can make a big difference. One of my key elements in my training is that to throw fast, not just to say to the players throw fast, but when to throw fast, when to wait, in what situations fast throwing are good, and so on and so on. There are, again, th this here is, the next one is not my data, it's from Total Impact, um, but it was from the 2021 Premier League season. Uh, on this side here, below, we have the average time for every throw-in. So Southampton, a little bit more than 15 seconds. We are the best here with 11 point something, closely followed by Chelsea. And on the other upside here, we have how big percentage of all throw-ins 
are super fast within five seconds. And you can see all in all that we are way ahead of all the others in the Premier League. So a small thing like taking the throw in fast is important. But you can also say small things can also give effect to other things. So we have seen that when you make your throw in fast, you're also taking faster free kicks. You're also sometimes, when it's necessary, taking faster taking faster corner kicks. You're also really good at, and that's also a point here, marking your phone, opponents fast when they have a throw in, getting organized, communicating. So, so small things can, can make big, big changes. So, um, yes, it, it's been going pretty well. <laughs> in Liverpool, the first season I was there, we won the, uh, the Champions League after 15 years of waiting time. The second season, 1920 season, we won the Premier League, and the club had waited there. 30 years, and Liverpool is a big, big club in, in England, so that's, it's been fantastic. But I've been so blessed to be a part of uh, 13 different titles all around the world. Uh, Flamingo, uh, Ajax, FC Midtjylland, Liverpool, uh, Philadelphia Union, we won the, the Eastern, uh, Eastern Conference Championship last year. Lost the MLS Cup in the last second against LAFC. So, um, but, but that's life sometimes. But I'm just as happy if I get can get a team from the second league to the first like we can in Europe, and, and things like that stay in the first league and so. But um, that was it. If anyone wants to look more around my co at my coaching, tomskronemark.com, you can connect with me anywhere. I all also started on TikTok. I have like there 18 followers or so. So I don't know if I should start to <laughs> do the dances or so. No. So um, yeah, uh, questions, questions. And I answer, I think, most. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's take it down there. Yeah. Uh, very good. So, uh, with the uh, long throw on footage. Yeah, I can hear it. Okay. I can hear it. Yeah, yeah, if you ask me, I think long throw-ins can be even more effective. But the thing you want to have is a long throw-in expert, like a really world-class, because I see many teams, for example, in Denmark, who are taking long throw-ins, but they can't even throw to the, to the small box in the air. But if you have developed that long throw-in taker, I think they can be even more efficient than, than, than a corner kick, because if you have that expertise, you can put the throw in everywhere you want. How many times does we see a corner kick going behind the goal or to the first man? So, so yes, uh, long throw-ins can be really efficient if you have world-class thrower and the right uh, strategy, because tactics is also a part of that. I, I didn't come into that here, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll say it's a little bit, it can both be tradition, but I also think sometimes coaches are saying, it's, it's not our playing style. And I think it's okay because I don't want to see, let's say MLS, I don't want to see 30 teams doing 10 long throw-ins in each game because that would be boring. I like the class of playing styles. So let's say one team, one third of the whole team does many long throw-ins, one third does no one at all, for example, like Liverpool or Ajax are coach, and, and, and the teams in between take perhaps one or two so once in a while. I like that, because, you know, but, but it's underestimated, and more teams can easily use it if they have to develop the world-class throwers. Yeah. Here. Thanks for the talk, super interesting. Um, I, I know you had mentioned you have specific like individual trainings for players. Does that apply as well to, you know, some players are instructed to never take throw-ins fast um, and they should always go slow or is, is the instruction for all players go fast if it's there? No, normally the instruction are all players go fast and it can be all, both, both strikers, uh, central defenders, midfielders, of course, the fullbacks or the wingbacks, depending on what you call them. Of course, if then we see a challenge that a, a, a specific, let's say Mo Salah, he's been doing many fast throw-ins. Let's say if I saw, wow, 50% uh, uh, of them are really bad, then of course we'll take it. But generally you have a big advantage because you, you have le less organized uh, uh, opponents and, and more time. But, but what I really learned the players is the decision making. Because it's, it's easy for, I can learn you now, okay, if there's a ball here, take the ball fast and throw it. Yeah, that's easy. But, but, but the, the, the challenge is when to throw it and not 
to throw it. And I try to learn that uh, to the players in training, for example, in, in small-sided games and so. Where we, have, we, we can make so many mistakes in, in training, that doesn't matter. So, so that's, that's the way I learn them. But by that, I say all players should take it fast, yeah? Over, over here, sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, so is Liverpool one of the teams that has the academy kids feeding the balls for, for fast uh, throw-ins? And do you work with them to you know, cycle the ball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm normally working with, with the ball, uh, ball boys, ball girls, uh, no matter what club it is. Um, not in the match itself, but I'm instructing the club what to do, how to do it. And I'll say, for, for me, I think every team, every team should... Um, and, oh, sorry, every club should give the ball fast to both teams because I hate to see that the home team give it fast and then, then the opponent's like, I won't give it or, or the manager takes the ball or they're like, okay, we roll the ball slowly. You know, I, I don't like it. Yes, if you're the winning team, home team, you said yes, but it's not good for the sport. So I've seen matches where, where both teams get it fast. I like it. That, that's the way it should be. So yes, I'm also working with the ball boys and the ball girls. Yes? Here? Uh, first of all, what was it like coaching with Jurgen Klopp and assuming Eric Ten Hag? Was it Ajax, uh, those two? And um, more of like a data approach question. Um, do you find that there is uh, more of a personality acceptance of your, your methods and, and uh, analysis, or is it more of a budget constraint? Uh, yeah, first of all, I, I think it's fantastic to work with these personalities, uh, uh, coaches, managers, because, and they're very, very different. Uh, you can say that uh, working with Jurgen Klopp is working like with your best friend. We have a lot of fun. We laugh a lot at Liverpool FC, and in other places, it's a little bit more like tight, you know. Uh, that's okay, but, but it's fantastic. And can you give me the last question again? Um, is the difference in acceptance of uh, analysis and, and your technique specifically uh, more due to personality differences or uh, budgets? Uh, I, th I think it's more about is, is the people innovative, uh, either thinking in an innovative way. It's not so much the budget. It's more about do I as a person, as a coach, and also as a player, s uh, see the worth of innovative thinking? Because sometimes I've been coming to not often, but to a club where I'm hired by the owner, and then the, the head coach is a little bit, little bit like that, um, throw-ins, you know, then it's hard, you know. So, so I think it's more about the personalities. Yes, everything is easier if you have more money. You know, it's crazy how many uh, money, for example, Liverpool are using on analysis, data, you know, even nutrition, food, everything, you know, and that, it makes life easier. But for me, it's more about what happens between years. That's so, so I'll, uh, yeah. So, uh, can we get you to Chelsea? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yes, uh, I saw one down here, there's one up here, yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Moyo with MVP Analytics. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, we're in the presence of the only throw-in coach in the world, that's one, and uh, you hold the record, or you held the record of the longest throw. I'm curious as to what the distance in regards to like radius and you know speed and all that good stuff. If you know like how far your throwing was. Oh yeah. So uh, again, it was uh, because of the time limit. But in 2010, I set an official Guinness World Record of 51.33 meters. I thought it would be pretty cool to uh, to have the world longest throw-in while you're the only throw-in coach in the world. And by the way, I set the world record with a flip throw-in, so jumping down on the ball, making a flip land. The only challenge was that I was a non-gymnast and I was weighing around 100 kilos. So one of the one of the things I did there, I was. To, to hold better on the ball, I went into the national television, a kids television program, and I tested three different sticky stuff, like prunes on a ball, uh, sweets on a ball, licorice on a ball, a uh, standing throw in with each ball, and then a flip throw in with the winner. So I used licorice every time. So that was also kind of uh, innovative. So, but again, I, I tried to, to beat the, the world record and have the world record because I thought it would give me some attention. It did too, so, um, but, but yeah. I didn't tell, tell about it here because of time, yeah, so, yeah. We have time for uh, one more question. Okay. <sighs> you? <laughs> uh, you had said that you're very easily able to teach the physical approach to throw-ins and, and that it's really the decision mentality that matters most. So you'd invoked art and Roman history and, and we're obviously here at a data conference as well, but to what extent is that approach teaching decision-making 
to a player are more quantitatively or quantitative, qualitatively driven, psychological? Like, what do you think? How do you think about your framework? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, for me, it's, it's I, I, I think I have the right framework. And the reason why I think that is because uh, there's a lot of, been a lot of attention around my coaching, especially in Europe. And a lot of analysis people have been saying, okay, uh, Liverpool scored this goal. And, and the, the way they did it was that Sadio Mane ran there and then John Henderson ran there and Bob Firmino ran there into that space, got the ball, and then they scored. And if we do the same, we, we, uh, we can also have success. But that's not the way I do it. Like I said before, I have the, like, the basics. I have the, the, the middle things with the small side games and then the zones. So I'm learning the players that, let's say we have a throw in in the middle. In, I have, for, for example, 15 basic options, but in theory, they could be in thousands of ways because different players, different angles, different timing, different lengths and everything. So I'm learning the players to see the space, um, to take decisions, uh, so for me, that's much more dangerous than having like a playbook with X plays. I'm not saying you can't have a playbook because sometimes with teams to say, now we try to do this. But all in all, I'd rather learn the players to read the space, take the decision. But also, obviously, when the opponents have a throw in, I'd rather learn them how to. For example, I have a thing called pressure risk. When is it good to pressure? Sometimes you have a low pressure risk. Then just pressure, 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 because you're not risking anything. It could be a striker who's zonal marking, two central defenders. If he has to help uh, with the pressure on the sixer, he can, might do it because he's only risking a, risking a, a throw to the nearest central defender. So, so things like that. So, so, so all in all, I, I'd rather learn the players to, to read the game instead of, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, OK, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Thomas, uh, thank you so much. This was fantastic. If anyone has questions afterwards, we can you know, move on, but we just want to be respectful of the next uh, CA. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.